Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Cultural Inclusion into the Therapeutic Behavioral Health Process, Stories of Healing. My name is B.C. Echohawk. On behalf of the Native Connections team and Contracting Officer Representatives Maureen Madison and Jan Dunbar Cooper, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. We do look forward to hearing from you, so please don't hesitate to use the raise hand function or chat box for questions or comments throughout the session. Today, grantee technical assistant Deborah Rattler will be opening us up in a good way. Deborah? Oh, thank you, BC. Um, you know, several years ago, oh, several years ago, I worked at a, um, a BIE elementary school, day school over in Washington state. Um, this was at Frank's Landing Indian community. And Frank's Landing was a, um, a pretty unique community because they were one of the only congressionally declared Indian communities that I've ever heard of. But it was a, um, I was there for about two years. But at this school, one of the things that they did every single morning, all year long, was they brought all of the children into the main foyer next to the office. And this was a way for all the children to kind of start bonding with each other, get, you know, get to know each other, start their day really in a good way. And they had a specific saying, you know, that they, that they would repeat every day. And I wanted to repeat, I wanted to say, to uh, recite that for you today, because I think it's some really powerful words. And I think it really goes well with our webinar today about how we include culture into, you know, the therapeutic process. And um, my role at that time was to um, develop a clinical counseling program for the school. And so I was really interested in, in how the school did this. So here's what they said every morning. I, I am, I am very special. I am very unique. I count. I am loved. I believe I can achieve anything I set my heart to. I believe in me and my people. I believe in our land and our way of life. I believe in our language and our culture. I believe in our land and way of life. I believe in the teachings of our elders. I believe there is a plan for my life. I believe in the power of prayer. I believe in God, the great spirit. Wait, this was something that I heard children from ages five all the way up to about 12 years old. If you can imagine hearing about a hundred children reciting this every morning, this was such a wonderful way that this school, Wahilut, prepared the children for their coming day. It set the stage for the children to know that they were important, they were loved, and that they could achieve what they set their mind to. And so I wanted to share that with you today as we move forward with this opening, with this webinar. So thank you. Thank you, Deborah, for that beautiful opening. Oki Nixakwa Nistu Nathanaku. Iposuaki. Good day to all you beautiful people. My name is Idella King, and I'm an enrolled tribal member of the Northern Arapaho tribe from the Wind River Reservation in central Montana. I'm also Blackfeet and Grovant, and I'm a new GTA with three stars working on the Native Connection grant. Currently, I reside in Spokane on the traditional homelands of the Spokane Tribal Nation in eastern Washington state. I'm married to Mr. Nathaniel King, who's a Diné from the Navajo Nation, and together we're state licensed foster parents. We've raised two children, and currently we have four grandchildren. In one of my former positions, I created a cultural curriculum for a therapeutic um, setting, and I wanted to kind of share a little bit more about that. But as we're just getting started, my co-facilitator is Val, and I would like for her to introduce herself. My name is Valerie Piaik. I'm also a grantee technical assistant with Three Star. My Chupik name is Kasuk, and I'm named after my maternal grandmother. I'm Chupik from the Kashinuit tribe 
in of Chivac, Alaska, and I'm currently based in Fairbanks, Alaska. And thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Val. Let's see. Hold on. As a former teacher, it's important for me to make sure we're, we all understand some of the concepts we'll be dis discussing throughout this webinar. So quickly, I wanted to define some of those concepts. Behavioral health refers to care that addresses mental health and substance misuse, life stressors and crisis, and self-related symptoms. Inclusion means the action of being included. Therapeutic process. This involves the patterns of conscious and unconscious thought, feelings, and behaviors that are brought to the awareness through relationship between therapist and client. Indigenous knowledge is the belief that Indigenous people of this land have a vast knowledge about the world in which they reside, even if it's not recognized or acknowledged by the mainstream industries. Today's webinar, we're going to examine some cultural activities and ways to integrate them into the therapeutic process to help our communities engage in healing practices. Next, Val is going to introduce the objectives for this webinar. Next slide, please. Today's objectives are to learn how other communities are integrating cultural teachings in a therapeutic way, review four digital stories that feature stories of healing and how culture activities enhance the therapeutic process, and also to discuss ideas about incorporating your culture into your programming. So our first polling question for today, please unmute yourself or write in the chat an example of a cultural activity you may have used, planned, or experienced in a therapeutic setting. Mm -hmm. As an educator, it's always important to be able to kind of activate that prior knowledge. So with this, um, if you can think of a time that you may have seen or experienced um, a cultural activity. In this slide here, one of the things we have set up is a stick game set. So for those of you who are familiar with this game on the West Coast, I think it's referred to as the Slahal game. Um, Montana, we call it hand games or stick game. So this is one of our um, traditional games that we've used in the therapeutic setting at different times. Thanks for adding some of those. Oh, we have some. Oh, we have some great examples already. Sweating, uh, sweating or sweats, smudging counting numbers in native language, berry picking, talking circles, beading, culture classes such as moccasin making and ribbon skirt making, chaspak making, mm -hmm. drum making, mm -hmm. moccasin making, mm -hmm. there's language classes. Thank you all for sharing your examples, singing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have a wealth of knowledge here today, that's for sure. Thank you, Val, and thank you for those who have submitted their examples. We learn best from our grantee communities. In our tribal nations before contact, our communities were whole and thriving. Everyone had a productive role in community that enabled them to contribute to the balance of community. Our family system shared kinship with the environment and were inclusive in how they related to the four-legged, the winged one, the underwater ones, the plants, trees, rocks, the landscape. In order to survive in our environments, we had to respect the relationship to land and to one another. We were the original practitioners, understanding how to live in balance, taking only what we needed when we harvested or hunted and to honor that in a good way. If there was a need, it was taken care of through relationship and finding balance. Solutions were abundant. From those original practitioners, we have carried those cultural practices, cultural teachings, and the tribal language the best way we could through the historical trauma that many of our tribal nations endured. At this time in our history, it's been almost 46 years since we've had the freedom to practice our traditional religions or sacred ceremonies, which was protected 
under the American Indian Religious Freedom Act of 1978. This really enabled our indigenous practitioners to come out of the darkness and bring back those cultural ceremonies to the light. I say it like this because some of our families and tribal people would engage in these activities are underground prior to this, this time. I think of blankets on the windows is how they would conceal the light through the night to hold those sacred ceremonies indoors. When I used to work with indigenous youth, I would ask them about blankets on their windows in their homes. And many would say this is something that happened even today in our families. I would explain why some of our families did this. I would also follow up and say, maybe your family was practicing their sacred ceremonies, which prior to 1978 would have been an illegal practice. I think about the teachings of our cultural medicines and the medicinal plants that we use. How did we learn about that? How did we learn about sweet grass or how it is to harvest it? If your tribe even uses that as healing, how and when people would use cedar, what types of cedar your tribal people used? These are all questions that we have answers for that today because of some of that resistance that our families and our communities carried forth. Today, it's widely accepted that engaging our American Indian Alaska Native youth to indigenous cultural practices strengthens their self-identity, their self-awareness, their self-confidence, if it's done in a good way. This fosters those protective factors that strengthen our youth to deal with everyday stressors effortlessly. Some of our programs have been able to utilize cultural practices and teachings as prevention activities. What are some of the activities and practices we can do to engage our families. Indigenous language has seen an increase in younger language speakers with the emergence of intentional educational practices. In the last 40 years, we have lost a lot of fluent speakers and in some tribal nation, there were a handful of fluent speakers left. Again, with the emergence of the right to practice our sacred ceremonies free of persecution, people were learning how to save their languages. They're no longer waiting around to see if our languages are going to leave. Today, it's commonplace to hear of immersion schools on many of our tribal nations and urban settings that teach nothing but language. Our indigenous children are becoming one of the fastest growing group of fluent speakers worldwide. So how do we integrate language into our programs to engage our families? In today's modern world, we're taught that focusing on our individual needs is the American way pulling yourself up by the bootstraps. That's a phrase that implies individual advancement. Although it may be difficult, everyone should be able to do this on their own, right? Well, that's not a part of our indigenous ways of knowledge. In fact, it's far removed from that. Our indigenous cultures are identified as collectivist cultures or along those definitions. We value generosity over selfishness, helping others while helping ourselves giving away to the community over hoarding for ourselves. Bringing together traditional healing practices with the therapeutic behavioral process allows our youth and families to learn to connect in this modern world to a place of healing, whether they're on their traditional homelands or they're removed from it. So how do we, connect, how do we create connections for our youth that allow them to feel connected to their tribal nations when they're not on their homelands? Valerie is gonna introduce the first two digital stories while watching these stories, please pay attention to how many cultural teachings you may hear or see. Next slide, please. Thank you, Adela. Before we get to the video, I would like to share the background for Healing on Our Homeland. It started with an effort here in Alaska called the Alaska Men's Wellness Project. I had recruited two individuals, one my father, John Pingayak, a Chipik elder from Chivak who was an educator for 34 years, and the second, Kenneth Hoyt, the Native Connections Coordinator of the Kanaitsi Tribe, to share their personal stories of wellness and traditional teachings that helped heal and strengthen them. Healing on our homeland was, is based in Chivak. I also wanna give you a little context of my parents' upbringing. My parents grew up in sod houses. They traveled through the rivers in canoes and they lived off the land. They were nomadic and moved from seal camp where they hunted seals and stored seal oil to make pokefish 
and dry meat. They then went to fish camp and from fish camp, they went to berry camp and they hunted and gathered throughout the fall season as well. So they lived off the land until it was time for them to go to school. It was then that they would make their way to Chivak and their main transportation was the canoes or wooden boats, which very few families had. And they used oars and sails rather than motors to make their way through the rivers and, and, the, and the sea. They also used the wind and the currents to get to their destinations. So they spent much of their lives on the land. So as you watch the video, I would invite you to pay attention and be mindful of the traditional teachings, values that you observe and how you might relate to them. I learned from my elders and my grandfather that when we return to our homeland, it is one of our traditional beliefs to eat a piece of earth or plant to help make our bodies immune to any sickness. And so we can also spiritually and physically readjust to our homeland. When we spend time on the tundra, doing activities like fishing, gathering driftwood, seal hunting, bird hunting, or gathering greens. It is therapeutic for our whole well-being, and I was taught to leave all my cares, worries, burdens, and frustrations to this land. When you do these healthy activities, it is a form of cleansing. When I return home, I am a new person. That is the way we meditate on this land. When we come back to our homeland, where we were born and raised, it is always a true healing. It is a really powerful healing because this land is where the Creator has put us and we have dominion over everything. The rivers, the seas, and the land and we know where to hunt and gather our resources. In our spirit, we are rich and have everything we need provided for us. It is really powerful to acquire and learn knowledge of the land and the sea and what it can provide for us. That is why we have values and traditional beliefs to help us where we are. We also have a great respect for our environment. Our nourishment from this land has always been part of our healing. Sometimes when people are away from their homeland and not eating their traditional foods, get into unhealthy habits of eating, which can lead to poor nourishment of essential nutrients within the body. Our traditional foods are naturally full of iron, calcium, and vitamin C. For example, the seal is rich in iron. The sand bears or cloud bears are rich in vitamin C. Even the needlefish is a great resource for calcium that many people do not eat today, but was essential for our survival in ancient times. Our people even have probiotics in the form of fermented and aged food sources. When someone is not feeling well, one can eat their traditional foods, which can help with the healing. I have seen this time and time again and have experienced this myself. This is what the elders and my grandfather taught me about our land and traditional foods. It is medicine for our people on a holistic level, for the mind, soul, and body. These ancient remedies or traditional ways of knowing have to be recorded and taught to the new generation so that they are not lost. My 
Trinidad shared just a few things that he learned from the Chipic elders of Chivac the and from his grandfather. Freezing cold ice bath just to show how this weird bag right here So getting back, getting back to um, my reflection, my dad shared a few things that he learned from the Chipic elders of Chivac and from his grandfather, my great grandfather, which I was fortunate and blessed to grow up around in my youth. I live in Fairbanks, Alaska, and because I live here a majority of the year, I do eat a piece of earth or plant when I return home to help my body readjust physically and spiritually to my homeland. And that also helps to make me immune to any sickness, just as my dad had shared. I can tell you during the times I forgot to do that, I got pretty sick. So I make it a point to do that when I return home. I grew up on the tundra. I grew up helping to gather driftwood. I spent summer, my summers at fish camp, at berry camp, at bird camp in the fall and, and helped gather greens in the summer months alongside my parents and my siblings. Just as my great grandfather taught my dad, my dad in turn taught me to leave my worries, my burdens, my cares and my frustrations to the land, which I refer to in my own life as tender therapy. So I see the value of it and that's what I practice. And it's also what I teach my own children. My dad also taught me, and I truly believe that it is a form of cleansing to be able to spend time on the tundra. It's a form of cleansing and renewal on a holistic level for my spirit, my mind, body, and soul. You also hear my dad talk about when one returns to their homeland, how, how very powerful, how it's such a powerful healing because that's where the creator put us. So I return home each summer for berry camp but really every chance that I get for those very reasons. It's also an opportunity for me to hunt and gather our traditional foods and bring them back with me to the city, which, add, which, which adds, as he shared, to our overall health and well-being. So for the next digital, digital story, this digital story is called Driftwood, which is also based in Chivac. Chivac is surrounded by tundra, it's located 160 miles northwest of Bethel, and it is about 13 miles inland from the Bering Sea. So there are no trees that grow in our region. So the driftwood that we gather drifts down the Yukon River and into the mouth of the Shunuk River. So we travel quite a ways for the wood and it's a lot of work, but necessary. The teachings that my great grandfather taught my dad are the very teachings that I learned growing up as a youth. When I come across a driftwood walking on the tundra, I am mindful of the teachings. I am mindful to, I, I, I bring to mind a prayer or, an, or a need that I have either for myself or my family and turn over a driftwood just as my ancestors did, just as you'll see in the, in the digital story. Park. John Pingayach is an elder from the village of Chivak, Alaska. He is a Chupik of the Kashinmu tribe and was an educator for 34 years. He is a carver, mask maker, has knowledge about cultural tools and ceremonies, Chupik beliefs and traditions, and is a composer of Chupik song and dance. He has shared his knowledge and wisdom all over Alaska. Chupik elders insist that our people live healthy and strong in our environment. Every resource had an explanation for how it exists for our well-being. One of these resources is the driftwood. We were taught that the driftwood has consciousness just as humans do that the wood has spirit and each piece knows what it will become. My late grandfather, 
Joe Friday described the wood having lively conversations as as they drifted across the oceans and the seas. Some say I will be a spoon, a bow, a harpoon, or a sled, or I'll be a kayak or a wood to build a house. Those that are going to be burnt for steam baths, fire, campfires, or for heating homes are set to express great joy and happiness as they will crackle and pop. As for the driftwood and its relation to wellness, there is a story about a man that was sick and not feeling well. A man would go out and turn over the driftwood he came across, especially the ones that were soaked with moisture and, and wet, even the ones that were rotting. My grandfather said to me, just imagine being that driftwood, lying on the tundra, but you could not turn over even as you're tired of laying on one side of your body. Those driftwood cannot turn over when they want to. When a person takes the time to roll the driftwood over, it is as a prayer to the Creator or God for something they need for themselves. A man my grandfather spoke of, turned over driftwood daily until his sickness was gone. When young people see elders turn over the driftwood today, they wonder why they are doing that. It is important for us to teach the youth about the things that help our ancestors through difficult times. That can still be applied today, even something as simple as turning over a driftwood. So just as my dad shared, these teachings are still practiced and still can be applied today. They're still relevant and an, an important part of our wellness. Next slide, please. So that brings us to our reflect, reflection. How many cultural activities did you hear Mr. Pingayak talk about? Or what is one cultural teaching that stood out to you? And is there one teaching that you would like to know more about from either of the stories that we saw? All right, Deborah said there was about 20 teachings and she lost count. There was a lot of teachings in, in just in both of those stories. Traditional food for healing, that's still practiced today. The drumming and the connection to the land and animals, the drumming. His knowledge of nutrients and tradi traditional foods was amazing. Gathering food and driftwood has for healing. Great. One of the teachings that I wanted to share is that, you know, in our gratefulness to the land, to, to creator and land. One of the ways we give back to the land is um, maybe some of you caught the scene where the picture where my dad was um, pouring water back onto the land. That's one way that we give thanks back to the creator and back to the land for the abundance of berries that we, you know, we just gathered. So we in turn um, bless creator and bless the land that blessed us with an abundance of berries or 
or maybe an abundance of fish, depending on the season. So that's one way we give back to the land or bless the land, which is, as Deborah said, respect for the environment through different activities, such as gathering food, berries, and turning over wood. Thank you for those reflections. They, they, and they're just a small part of you know what what these digital stories represent and, and teach. And these are th still things that we teach our our youth. And I and I love that you know Deborah shared that now every time she sees a driftwood, she'll stop and turn it over and say a prayer. That's beautiful. Idella. Yeah, thank you, Val. And thank you for those that engaged in the reflection questions. Um, and so let's see, the next two digital stories are some examples of cultural inclusion in the therapeutic process from programs. The first digital story is from the Healing Lodge of the Seven Nations, which is a partner organization that has been in, identified in a couple of our grantees communities CSA. As you're listening to this short digital story, pay attention to the activities they talk about using with their clients or their, their, um, their youth. Um, are these activities doable? How would you imagine integrating some of these into your program? And who would your partner be to learn more about your tribal teachings? The Healing Lodge of the Seven Nations um, is a 90-day youth adolescent treatment program here in Eastern Washington. Um, this is open to all youth in the state of Washington who, who have need. Um, it's also opened up to a lot of um, Indigenous youth throughout the United States. Um, this is one of the places that I worked, and I'm excited to share with you this digital story. Let's see. Go ahead and... Yep, yeah, there we go. Thanks. High suicides, homicides, sexual violence, assaults, drug overdoses, addictions, and incarceration rates among Native youth has impacted Native communities and non-Native communities alike. Native youth enrolled and descendants are in our schools, our communities, our families, losing connection to culture, to themselves, to our families, to our communities, our futures. Healing Lodge of the Seven Nations Adolescent Residential Treatment Program integrates traditional, spiritual, and cultural values with chemical dependency counseling to create a holistic approach towards healing. Through our sweat lodges, our use of traditional practices, our use of traditional songs, creating, writing, experiencing music, or use of medicinal plants, teaching how to reconnect, how to find our way healthy, reconnecting to education, mental health support, our healthy nutrition program, our experienced knowledgeable staff, understanding the addictions, healing the whole person, emotionally, physically, mentally, and spiritually. Studying the correlation between our native culture teachings and drug and alcohol treatment, work to heal the hurting individual is crucial to support the holistic approach towards healing. Well, thank you. I wanted to take a moment and kind of talk about that experience I shared earlier. Let's see. I just want to make sure I'm off mute. Um, so when I first started at the Healing Lodge of the Seven Nation, I came in as an entry level position. Um, I think I was called a skills coach. And those are the individuals that are with the youth that help them um, coach them on um, the new things that they learn. So one of the well, we had a couple different programs that our youth was were learning. One of them was the DBT, Dialectical Behavioral Therapy. And so as a coach, we would help encourage them to um, learn their coping skills and to practice them with us. While I was there, 
Um, at that time, I think we were going through a change in leadership. And so the cultural program was something that was almost like an elective to some of our, our youth. It wasn't something that was a part of programming at that time. Um, and with my background, I, I checked it out and I was like trying to figure out, you know, one of the ways, how could we engage more of our youth during this, this time? And so with the leadership, really had an opportunity to kind of um, try some new things. And one of the things I started doing was creating lesson plans as an educator, um, being able to kind of see how to engage youth was something that I really enjoyed and I'm really good at. So that first year I was there, I got a lot of opportunity to kind of come up with some ideas. So in creating those lesson plans, eventually it turned into a whole cultural curriculum that I had created. And like I said, at first, the cultural program was this kind of secondary to everything that was happening. And I know the original intent of this um, adolescent treatment program was to use the cultural for holistic healing for our young people. But like I said, as leadership changes, when we have one leaving and one coming in, there's kind of some lag time in between. And so it was at that time that I was able to kind of start using some of my um, lesson plans with our youth. And at first, um, like I said, um, just some of the kids were kind of interested in what, what I was doing. But because of the consistency and being an Indigenous person myself, um, people started getting curious, our youth started getting curious. And before you know it, I started having a lot of our young people who were coming into my cultural project groups or my animal teaching storytelling groups. And eventually, what I realized is that because it's a 90 day program in the state of Washington, if you if a youth comes into a program like this, if it's longer than 30 days, we have to provide them with um, an education program. And so using that education program and the fact that our kids were there for 90 days, I really decided to look at seasonally how we could incorporate a program that each and every one of our kids would have the opportunity to participate in and, and get all of the great teachings that we had. So I created a 12 week program that rotated four times a year. So in each season, we would have springtime, summertime, fall time and winter time. And using the medicine well as kind of my basic foundation. I was able to use this rotating schedule to help our youth. If we had a youth that came in in the springtime at week four, if they stayed the whole 90 days, then they would be leaving at week four during our summertime curriculum. And the only thing that really changed in the in that four, four times a year that we did our 12 week course was um, the ability and what we had to do. So in the summertime, we did a lot of harvesting around our local community. In the wintertime, um, we had more time to start telling some of the stories. In our region here, um, we were unable to tell stories until the winter time. Um, our elders had shared with us that when the snow hits the ground, that's when we can start talking about some of our stories. So what, what our youth experience in the winter time did look very different than in the summertime, but through that cultural curriculum, they were getting the same information. So each of those weeks, we developed a different theme. So I think our first week was about respect and what respect looked like in our indigenous way. So when you have our adolescents coming in with their culture that they're coming from, some of our young people were really a part of like gang culture. And in that gang culture, respect is something that um, our youth would describe it as, well, that individual has to respect me before I respect them. And I would explain in our indigenous way of knowledge, respect starts with self. When we can respect ourselves, we can respect others. So this, um, looking at the different cultures, our young people were able to kind of start seeing, you know, how they can switch that respect, not necessarily expecting respect from others, but how would they start respecting themselves? And like I said, in my cultural curriculum, I had created four different classes. One was cultural projects. And so in that video, 
you see in a couple of the different slides that or pictures that showed medicine, um, like different necklaces, we made these medicine pouch necklaces. And in all of these cultural projects, we started um, with some really basic knowledge, and then we worked our way up. So what they learned in week one would really help them in week seven or week eight. And the other part of the cultural program is once they went through the program, the idea was what they learned they were able to take with them. And so in the cultural projects class that they had, I would oftentimes explain to them how they could facilitate this as young people. For example, if they became um, camp counselors um, during the summer times, because in a lot of our tribal nations, our youth have the opportunity to work in work programs. And so I said, some of these projects, you're gonna be able to turn around and teach to other youth or to your younger siblings. I always explain that everything that they learned, true mastery was being able to turn around and share that and teach that. And so these were also different forms of assessment. And I explained that to our youth too. So with the alternating four times a year, one of the things I did not realize is that our clinical staff was really watching what I was doing. They did not really um, participate at first in, in the programming that I started creating. They were checking it out. They would come to a class, they would, they would observe, and then they would leave. And then before I knew it, I had one of our clinicians come to me and said, you know, Idella, one of the things I noticed about your 12-week curriculum is sometimes in some of your seasons, you have 13 weeks and sometimes you have 12. Can you please make sure that each of your seasons has 12 weeks? This really blew my mind because I, there was a reason why some of our um, seasons had 13 weeks and some had 12. And that had to do a lot with the moon and um, the cycles of the moon. For me, as an Indigenous person, that was a, a part of a teaching that um, I learned. And so I was really shocked when they said, can you just keep it to 12 weeks? And so I inquired a little bit more, like, explain to me why this needs to be 12 weeks. And they said, well, we lined up our our curriculums to kind of go with what you're doing because what you created makes sense. So one of the things um, I realized right then and there that I really need to needed to start working with that therapeutic um, the therapeutic community on campus, and I needed to explain to them what I was teaching because a lot of what I was teaching with the culture was how um, our young people can learn more about themselves. And they were teaching coping skills, um, different ways in which to learn how to work together, you know, social, emotional teaching. And so having a seat at that table, being invited in that with those clinicians, I was able to explain to them what I was doing. And they were able to share feedback with me on how important um, self-awareness is. And so as, as I evolved in this position, I started including a lot of the DBT skills, the dialectical behavioral skills, you know, mindfulness, um, radical acceptance. And so as long as I could explain and talk about them from that indigenous perspective, our youth were really having those teachings reinforced throughout the facility. And it's, it's, um, it was pretty cool what we were able to create with that 12 week program. But then another opportunity came up. Um, the educational program that we had on campus was kind of struggling a little bit. And so my supervisor placed me into the educational program, which at first I wanted to stay in our cultural program because I loved what I created and I wanted to teach that. But they eventually got somebody else in there to do that. So with our educational program at the Healing Lodge in the state of Washington, we have um, a group of um, education people <laughs> that are a part of institutional education. And institutional education in the state of Washington really focuses on the education for incarcerated youth. And so in the institutional education, we learned about best practices. What's the best thing for our population? And that statewide, 
um, we started using a model called an ALE, which is an alternative learning education. And so for me, being in, being in the education in the classroom, what I noticed is those same kids that were thriving in our cultural program really struggled when they were in that educational setting. Even though that educational setting for on campus at the Healing Lodge was only one hour a day, that was a hard one hour to, to deal with those young people. But what I started realizing is that they were having educational trauma. They were experiencing that, you know, when um, in their home schools and their home communities. And a lot of our kids really fought back against being in the education program while they were there. They would say, you know, I came to treatment to learn more about um, myself. I did not come to treatment to go back to school. I dropped out of school. I don't want to be in this. So like I said, with my um, with creating this awesome cr cultural curriculum and being a teacher, I really had to look at the best things that we could do for our young people. And so in creating this ALE model, we also were able to bring in um, PBIS, which is something that a lot of schools all over the United States um, have in their, in their districts. PBIS is Positive Behavioral Intervention Systems. And considering that we had a small school inside of this treatment center, bringing PBIS to this facility actually was really um, our, our staff really struggled with it because the basis behind PBIS was focusing on positive behaviors and not focusing on um, behaviors that um, were kind of menacing, you know, the behaviors that, um, you know, kids that didn't want to be at school were displaying. And so the shift was really hard for our staff to embrace. But as an Indigenous person, um, I just think about some of our traditional teachings, you know, in ceremony, we don't get up and talk about, you know, how bad or how rotten a kid is or a person is in our traditional ceremonies. You know, when we have somebody who might do something wrong, we have a lot of people around who are willing to take the time and help our young person or a person who's new to these ceremonies learn um, in a in a good way, we you know we don't shame our people publicly. So PBIS was something that um, was a, a good step. Well, in that, it also went from talking about rules to expectations. And so um, an expectation would be, you know, when you're in this area, you're expected to come prepared rather than um, when you come into school, you're supposed to have everything with you. Why didn't you have all this? So that, those are just a little bit of um, examples, but with the ALE program, what we were able to do by having a certified teacher was all of the classes that our youth attended while they were at the treatment program eventually became credit bearing classes for them. So when they went to their life skills class, that ended up being a, a class that had a course code. And our course codes, um, OSPI sent um, someone over to check out all our different curriculums. And we, of course, had my cultural curriculum. And that was one of the ones that was approved through our district and um, statewide through our OSPI office. And so the DBT class that I talked about earlier, the life skills classes that they were attending, their drug and alcohol classes that um, they were a part, a part of, cultural classes, we had a music program, all of those classes became high school and middle school credits. So depending on where our kids were coming from, we were able to develop like an educational program for each of our kids. And what a lot of people don't realize is when you're in middle school or high school, you never have the opportunity to be assessed on the knowledge you currently possess. So when they would come into our facility, into the education program, we had the opportunity to really see where our kids were coming from. And some of our kids had really low um, reading levels, math, you know, their math levels were pretty low. And so we were able to focus on what our students needed rather than everybody's going to learn about math today. And once we started breaking down our education and expanding it campus wide, our students were able to 
start pretending or practicing like they were in school. And while they were there, they had the opportunity to get up to three credits while they were there. And in Washington state, our credits are, are um, kind of set up a little bit different. And the reason why I guess, um, well, let's see, I just noticed the time. And the reason why I wanted to kind of share this is that this was a therapeutic setting. And by combining our culture and the education, our kids were able to learn how to advocate for themselves, like in the educational setting, but they were also had um, real, real life credits. Like I had different administrators asking, well, are these just GED credits? Are these just, you know, fake credits? And I said, no, these are real credits. So when our kids left our facility, they were able to take home a lot of their, um, their credits from, from our facility and, you know, plug them into what they were doing. And a lot of times after treatment, getting back into the educational setting was a place for our kids to continue learning more about themselves, learning more about their community. So the next um, slide we're going to see, um, Val, do you want to introduce that one? Yes. Thank you, Adela. One of the best ways we learn is from one another. And so sharing your personal experience and the lessons you learned along the way and working with the education system about culture and about how youth learn social and emotional teachings and learning self-awareness from, a, a from an indigenous perspective is so important and so encouraging. So thank you, Adela. So moving forward, our next digital story is called The Healing Journey with Kai Shane. Kaishane Daniels is a youth ambassador with the Two Feathers Native American Family Services. She, sh she shares her journey as a Yurok youth and how reconnecting and re-engaging with her culture has helped, has helped her stay away from substance abuse and helps to deal with trauma. This simple 30 second method reverses memory loss for good. It I'm we'll just wait a second for the commercial to go by. Shan Daniels. I am 14 years old and I come from both the Trinidad Rancheria and Yurok tribe. I was born and raised in Humboldt County my whole life. My experience with substance abuse, I personally have not struggled with addiction, but I have definitely dealt with addiction in ways that are hurtful. I've struggled with it with my mother with my father, with a lot of people in my family. You don't need to struggle from abuse personally to be affected by it, pretty much. Because of my mom's struggle with addiction, we were removed from her care. I was separated from my brother and sister. I've moved from family to family's houses while my mom continued to fight addiction. Because of addiction, my dad He's been absent pretty much my whole life. Like, he comes and he goes, obviously, like a lot of addicts do. My mom, she fought and she tried, but addiction isn't something that's easy to overcome. And I wish I could under have understood that more because I was just left with the constant thought of, like, why are me and my brother and sister not good enough? Like, why does she always just have to go back to it? But now I realize that it's a lot more than that a lot lot more than that and it's not easy and i mean it puts a lot of people through pain unfortunately on august 30th my mom lost her battle to addiction 
she passed away, which is also a day before my birthday, so causing me to find out on August 31st, my 14th birthday, that my mother is gone. My advice to people out there struggling with addiction that have children is remember that you're not only hurting yourself, you're hurting a lot of other people with your addiction. You're not only bringing yourself down, you're bringing everyone down with you. Your choices you make, even if it's the smallest thing, you always got to think about your kids. Like you brought them into this world, it's your job to take care of them. And if you're struggling with addiction, you can't be your best at that. You can't do your best job. People in active addiction often make risky, poor choices, choices that don't only affect them, but a lot of other people. And my mom had made one of those choices and now she is no longer with us. What helps me get through everything right now is just remembering that times weren't always bad. There's a lot of good memories with my mom, especially summer of 2019. The brush dances, the river trips, the car rides, the singing, just like everything, the camping. So I definitely need to focus more on that sometimes. My hope for myself is to break the cycle of addiction that my family has been in for quite some time. If there is one thing that I would want any kid to know that has parents or anyone, a loved one that is struggling with addiction is remember that it is not your fault. Mackie shared that this young woman is wise beyond her years, and her ability to share her story to educate others shows a strength that I can only marvel at. I agree with you, Maggie. Kimberly shared it is so heartful, heartfelt. And Sarah, what a strong young woman to, to break the to break the cycle. Definitely a story of strength and courage. And from watching the video, what are two cultural activity cultural activity cultural ideas you could use with youth? What are two cultural activity ideas you could use with youth? Please share those in the chat. And what is one cultural activity idea you could use with families? So what's, your, what's a cultural activity that you could use with youth and what's another you could use with families? Storytelling, play acting, role playing, storytelling, camping, dancing and singing together. I can think of regalia making Regal, you can, a youth can make regalia. She had beautiful regalia. That could happen as a youth or even as a family. Moccasin making, which they have done, which Mitzi Stripe has done. And for the family, Navajo shoe game. Beading, regalia making, cooking, making traditional masks, these are all excellent ideas. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Valerie, carving using driftwood. Right. Carving using driftwood. Dancing. And even learning about your history, the history of your people, what, what kind of um, stories are shared through dance. Why do you make the regalia the way that you do? Berry picking, gathering. And thank you for your ideas. Excellent ideas. Fishing. 
Adela, back to you. Hey, did we, did we just lose Idella? <laughs> oh, I was on mute. I'm really oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> I said, um, thank you everybody for sharing and putting your information or your ideas into the chat. And thank you for, thank you, Sarah, for coming off mute. Can we have the next slide, please? Mm In wrapping this up today, I wanted to just kind of talk about one thing that I had mentioned earlier, you know, doing this in a good way. Um, one of the times at the lodge with one of my students, I had a um, one of our clinicians who asked, well, she didn't ask, but um, she pointed at one of our young Indian men to get up and say a prayer in his language to start her group out in a good way. You know, when we had talked, she felt like, okay, I want to integrate this into that therapeutic process. And so how she went about it is not what I would have recommended. And her and I later had to talk about this. But when she did that, the young man that she had pointed to, he was um, a little bit of background. He was adopted. And so he was just starting to learn more about his tribal nation and where his origin story came from, what tribe he was a part of. And he looked, he had long hair, he had um, brown skin, dark eyes. And for her, that looked like um, what a Indian who knew how to speak their language looked like. And so by her pointing him out when he was walking in, that actually really shamed him. And he really um, changed behaviors before he was engaging beautifully in his treatment program. And after that incident, he had all kinds of behaviors and the staff really wasn't sure what happened, but because um, he knew who I was and we had built some trust together, he came up and he explained to me what had happened and how this made him feel. He ended up feeling like he really wasn't a native kid and he felt like he, he, um, he just shared that with everybody. Like, I don't know nothing about being native. And when I had brought this to our team's attention at first, they tried to minimize what I had shared with them. They tried to say, no, these are just addictive behaviors and he's not doing his program. So again, when you're trying to integrate these cultural ideas and practices into the therapeutic process, it's really important that you're able to sit down with your therapeutic people, your clinicians, um, your educators, your your cultural people, and really start learning how to build trust with one another. Um, me being the indigenous educator, you know, I was the expert in this situation when it came to culture. And I was discounted because it's like, no, you don't understand. These are addictive behaviors. And so I was like, no, you really have to understand, you know, we don't do that in our culture. We don't point somebody out and say, hey, you come and do this. You know, we talk to them and we open that up. And so after, you know, some different discussions and dialogues, you know, the clinician and I were on the same page and she, you know, we ended up sitting down with this young man and she was able to apologize. And, you know, we worked with our community to repair that environment, to make sure that she learned from this, but that this young man was okay and where he was in his healing journey. And so that's what I want to leave with you all today is that when you have the opportunity to bring culture into these therapeutic spaces, make sure you have time to really get creative, but also to create that trusting foundation between your clinicians and your cultural people. And always look into your community and even our own families to look for those knowledge keepers. Because a lot of times we come from all kinds of different backgrounds. And so with that, I really appreciate you all um, sharing in the chat box all these different great ideas. This will be recorded, and if you ever need to come back and come up with some different ideas that you know you want to get outside of the box and figure out how to bring some of these cultural teachings, the, this is a good start for you. 
So with that, next slide, please. Any questions, comments, or concerns? I know we're running out of time. If anyone would like to come off mute or share, Kimberly from the chat said, thank you very much. This has been very informative. Mm -hmm. Dr. Marty said, great webinar. Thanks, ladies. Love the digital stories. Yes. And if mm -hmm. thank you deborah love the digital stories and they each had a very powerful message yes well thank you all for joining us today and with that next slide please <laughs> uh, thank you yes thank you each and every one of you mm -hmm. Kuyana, mm -hmm. thank you for joining us, Kuyana. Mm -hmm.